Okay, so I've been told that you haven't seen Zorn Slamma before, which is surprising. You should have at least heard of it. So just to make sure that you understand what it is and how it is used, even though I, like I had told you last lecture that I was not going to prove it in class because I didn't have time, I decided I changed my mind and I'm going to prove it. In, I'm going to show one application in class, okay? And then we're going to start talking about cardinal numbers. Let's, talk, let's prove that every vector space is a basis. Okay? Proof. Let V be a vector space over. Everyone has taken linear algebra, right? So everyone knows what a vector space is. Muted vector spaces over arbitrary fields or real numbers only? Only real numbers. Okay, I'm just going to talk about some arbitrary vector space over a field F, some arbitrary field. It can be finite, it can be whatever you want. Okay? Let P be the set of all linearly independent subsets of V, okay? So, P is all subsets of V which are linearly independent. Linearly independent. Now consider the following relation. Consider the relation less than or equal to on P given by A is less than or equal to B if and only if A is a subset of B. So I order elements of P by inclusion. You can check that this is a partial order relation. Then this is a partial order relation. This is just by properties of the subset relation. Claim this satisfies the hypothesis of Sorn's lemma. Let this be a chain in P. I want to show that the hypothesis of Sorn's lemma is satisfied, so I just take a chain. I need to find an upper bound for this chain. Okay? Now, I claim that the union of elements in this chain is in P and is an upper bound for this chain. It is clear that if this is actually in P, then this is supposed to be greater than or equal to all elements in this chain because I define this as the union. So this will be a superset of this. Okay? Now we first have to show that this is actually in P. When is something in P? If it is linearly independent. Okay? So let. Oh. Assume that this S is not linearly independent. Now, what does it mean? Then, there are field elements and vectors such that When you add the, these up, you get zero. And some of these are, these are all non-zero. Okay? This is what it means for S to be linearly dependent. 
you should be able to find some linear combination of some vectors which add up to, uh, which is zero, okay? But since now S is the union of these S alphas, there is alpha one, alpha two, da, 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 alpha n, such that S is the union of these guys, which means that these vectors are coming from Vi comes from S sub alpha i, okay? So these vectors come from some pieces. Now, here's the important part. Since S, since this collection is a chain. Now, Vi comes from S sub alpha i. But these are, these guys form a chain, which means that any two are comparable. But the relation over here is the subset relation. So one of them has to be the greatest guy, which means that it has to contain all the other ones. Because this is a chain, one of S sub alpha i is the greatest and hence contains all the others. So one of these guys contain all these vectors. But then this can't this guy can't be linearly independent. This S sub alpha sub K can't be linearly independent because I have finitely many vectors on this guy in the sky whose non-zero linear combination gives me zero. So this can't be linearly independent. So the idea is if this union were linearly linearly dependent then the witness to linear dependence would come from one of these guys. Not from multiple of these guys, but one because I'm, I'm using the fact that this is a chain here, okay? It is important. Thus, this is linearly independent. <laughs> Thus, S is linearly independent and Clearly, now this is in P, I can compare S with these guys. Now by definition, S sub alpha, it's a subset of S, so it's less than or equal to S. So this is an upper bound. So I've, I got a chain and I found an upper bound for this chain by Zorn's lemma there is a maximal element now let me use the other board say B is a maximal element of P. Look at the span of B. Let W be the subspace of V, which is the span of this B. If the, if the span were not the whole thing, then there would be some vector which is not in the span and this b together with this vector would be linearly independent. Why is this true? 
I mean, this is a general fact, but let's understand why this is true. I pretend that W is not all of V, then I would be able to find some vector outside. Take this vector and add, it, add this to B. I claim that this is linearly independent. Why? Take elements of this, okay? Take a linear combination of these elements. Some element from B, some element of from B, that, 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 some element from B, and I have this coefficient of V, which I'm going to call K, and I set this to zero. I want to show that all the coefficients are zero, okay? Now put this to the other side, minus KV. If this K were non-zero, I would, because I'm working in a field, I would divide by minus K, and get this. But then V would be in the span of B. I know that V is not in the span of B, which means that I can't do this. So why can't I do this? In order for me not to be able to do this, this K should be zero. But if K is zero, I already found a linear combination of, well, I have a linear combination from ve of vectors from B, which which is zero. Because B is literally independent, these coefficients should be all zero. So if whenever I assume that a linear combination of, of vectors from B plus K times V equals zero, I just get that all the coefficients are zero. That is literally what it means for this to be linearly independent. But if this is linearly independent, I contradict the maximality of B because this is bigger than B, which contradicts the maximality of B. Thus, W is V, and W is spanned by B, so B is a basis for V, okay? So this B I got is, it's a basis for my vector space. Questions? Now this is a pretty standard application of uh, this is a pretty this is a pretty standard application of Zorn's lemma. When you go home, try to prove that every commutative ring with unity has a maximal ideal. Okay. Using the exact same strategy, form a partial order where the order relation is inclusion, and then show that you have hypothesis of Zorn's lemma satisfied. Apply Zorn's lemma and then show that the maximal element you get is actually the maximal ideal you're looking for, okay? So is this application understood? Okay. Now that we're done with this, okay, it's good that I did this in class because Yeah, this is, one of the aims of this course is to teach you how set theory interacts with rest of the mathematics, like in practice, and this is one of the ways, like certain fundamental things like existence of basis or ideals, you have to, you have to use zone slam or some equivalent, like valor ring theorem. I don't know a proof which uses valor ring theorem directly. Well, okay, I actually know such a proof. Here's another proof that you can do. This is more complicated. Well, not more complicated. This is also easy, but I don't want to write this down. Here's another proof of this, which uses valor ring theorem. Start with a vector space, take any, and valor your vector space, okay? So your vector space is now well ordered by some relation. So I can enumerate its elements by some ordinal because every well ordered set is isomorphic to an ordinal. Take any vector, look at its span. If it does not span the whole thing, then there's an, there are elements outside. Take the least element with respect to your well ordering, add it inside. Look at the span now. If it's not the whole thing, there are elements outside, take the least element. Now, a <coughs> Repeat this by transfinite recursion. So by transfinite recursion, you're going to do the following. Take an element, look at its span, 
If it's not the whole thing, pick an element from outside. Look at its span. If it's not the whole thing, pick an element from outside. The thing that allows you to pick an element from outside is the Velour Ring Theorem because you're saying that I'm going to choose the least element from outside. And then you have to do a transfinite recursion and then at some point you have to stop because, again, because of Hartog's number, the existence of Hartog's number. There are like only a limited amount of elements in your vector space. At some point you will stop. Okay, at some point you won't be able to do, you, you won't be able to pick an element from the outside. It, whatever you constructed, at, uh, you have constructed at that point will span the whole thing. Well, that would be uh, the basis of your vector space, okay? So you can prove it like this as well. But I, I really don't know a proof which uses the original form of axiom of choice we introduced of this fact. Anyway, that's that. Now, I don't have much time, 25 minutes, so let's talk about... Yes. Yes. Oh, from that, yes. No, but I was talking about the other, like, the, there's this other form, right? Like, product of non-empty sets is non-empty. Well, it's the same thing. Yes, you're right. I'm being stupid. Yes. Yes, that works too. You don't have to pick the least element. Yes. I mean, you only have to pick some element. I, why, I don't know why, am I, why was I choosing the pick, uh, fixed, uh, least element. Can't you do like, uh, show Yes, you can do it like this. Like, you want to prove the value ring theorem not from Zorn's lemma, but from axiom of choice, right? Yes, you can do it like this. Pick an element, then if there are other elements outside, add it as the top element, as the greatest element. Now, if there are elements outside, keep doing this, yes. Because you're basically, like, you remember the proof of Zorn's lemma where I did a transfinite recursion to find a, There was a transfinite recursion in the proof of Zorn's lemma, right? Basically, okay, what you're doing is you're unraveling the proofs. You're basically combining these two proofs together. That works. You take an element, if, if there are other elements, take it, add this as the greatest element. Now add one more element if there are other elements. Just keep doing this transfinitely. By a transfinite recursion, you're going to say the following. If there's an element outside, I'm adding this as my top element, as the greatest element. If I have exhausted the whole thing, then I'm going to stop. Then this, you prove that this transfinite recursion has to stop somewhere. Otherwise, you would get an injective mapping from ordinals to your set, which would contradict the existence of Hartog's number. And then, whenever you stop, you will have constructed a valid relation on your set. Yes, that completely works. I, I wanted to do the circle, the loop, with Zorn's Slam and Velder Ring Theorem. This is why I proved Zorn's Slam like this. But you can directly prove Velder Ring Theorem from axiom of choice like that. Indeed, when I use acts like, when I do such things in practice, I myself always use Velder Ring Theorem, not Zorn's Slam like. This is pretty standard, but the other one seems more intuitive to me. Like, picking elements one by one by transfinite recursion. Take your, like, just extend your basis until you actually get a basis. Like, extend your linearly independent subsets. At some point, you will have to stop. So that works completely. And we can prove this fact about vector spaces directly from the original form of axiom of choice. I was being stupid. Anyway, let's start talking about cardinal numbers. Now, definition, an ordinal number alpha is called a cardinal number f. So the first thing you should realize is that a cardinal number is an ordinal number. It's a special type of ordinal number. If Alpha is not equinumerous. It's not in a bijection with 
some beta less than alpha. If you have an ordinal number which can't be put in a bijection with previous ordinals, then you call it a cardinal. For example, okay, here are my ordinals. Omega times three, omega times four, omega times yeah, that, that goes like this at some point. I have omega one. Now, all finite ordinals are cardinal numbers. Why is four not, a, not in a bijection with previous natural numbers? Because of the pigeonhole principle. There is no injection from some natural number to a smaller natural number. So there exists no bijection between these guys by pigeonhole principle. Now this is infinite. These are finite. There is no injection from here to here. We showed that as well by pigeonhole principle. So this is a cardinal number. However, this is not a cardinal number because this is countable. This is also countable. This ordinal is also countable. This ordinal is also countable. And these are all countable. The first and countable ordinal, remember, we named it omega 1. So that's a cardinal number because this is the set of all countable ordinals. And it is itself is uncountable, so it's not in a bijection with previous ordinals. It's not equinomers to previous ordinals. So this is uncountable, these are countable, this is a cardinal number. The next cardinal number will be omega 2, okay, and so on. But let me just list two more ordinal numbers. These are again ordinals which are not cardinals because they're in a bijection with omega 1. So a cardinal number is an ordinal number which is not equinomers with previous ordinals. Now remember cardinal numbers are supposed to measure sizes of sets. So how, how do they achieve this? Let x be a set. Then x can be well ordered by the axiom of choice or by the well ordering theorem or by zone theorem or by whatever you want to say. These are all equivalent. Then by some relation less than. Then this is, this part well ordered set is isomorphic to a unique ordinal. So there is a unique ordinal, alpha such that this is isomorphic to this as strictly well ordered sets. It's supposed to be strict. Now, thus, the set of ordinals, well, okay. Well, yeah, let me write like this. The set of ordinals such that x and alpha are equinumerous, this is not empty because there's at least one ordinal. Because if there's an isomorphism between this and this, then that isomorphism a bijection is non empty and has a least element. Remember, if there is some ordinal satisfying some property, there is a least ordinal satisfying that property. The least ordinal alpha, which is equinumerous to x, is a cardinal number. This is, by definition, if, well, almost by definition, just think of Think about this a little bit. If you have an alpha which is the least ordinal which is equinomerous to x, that means that this is equinomerous to x and previous ordinals are not equinomerous to x, which means that alpha is not equinomerous with previous ordinals, so it's a cardinal number and is called the cardinality of x. 
and is shown by this notation, okay? So the cardinality of a set X is the least ordinal with which X is equidimerous. And there exists such ordinals because every set can be well ordered and therefore can be put in a bijection with some ordinal. And I'm going to use this notation to denote the cardinality of X. Now I used this notation before. What you should realize at this point is my usage of this notation is consistent. For example, when did we say, when did we write this? We wrote this if there's an injection from here to here. This is the same as the cardinality of x as an ordinal number being less than or equal to the cardinality of y. Okay? So my consistent is, my consistent what? My notation is consistent with my previous usage. Sorry to the viewers, I'm a bit tired today. <laughs> I could have said my consistent usage of notation persists, which would just make up for that, but whatever. So this is the cardinality of a set. Any questions about these notions? Are you sure? Then, let me define the LFs, LF numbers. Oh, an exercise. This is going to look a bit stupid when I write this down, but there is just a little content, not that much. Let A and B e be sets. Show that. This is easy, so you may have some struggles trying to solve this because when I assign really easy exercises for some reason, you think that the solution can't be that simple and you try to invent stuff which is not there. So show that the cardinality of a Cartesian product is the same as cardinality of the product of cardinalities. And cardinality of set of functions from B to A is the same as cardinality of the set of functions from cardinality of B to cardinality of A. And finally, the cardinality of a cardinality of a set A is cardinality of A. This is obvious because this is the least ordinal which is equinomerous to A. The least, or, the least ordinal which is equinomerous to the least ordinal equinomerous with A is itself. So that's supposed to be that. Now, any questions up to now? I'm going to introduce LF numbers. And this is important. This will be a complete list of a complete list of cardinal numbers, which we're going to prove. But it's not going. It's not, not obvious by definition. I'm just going to list all the cardinal numbers. So, by transfinite recursion, define. the following class of ordinals. LF, it's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? And I think the second letter is Beth. We're going to use both of these in set theory. They're like used a lot because there's a strong group of Jewish set theorists who had enough influence to effect annotation. We will have LF numbers and Beth numbers. We also have other numbers corresponding to other Hebrew letters, but we're not going to learn about those. Those are more technical. So LF numbers are defined like this. 
Aleph zero is the ordinal omega. It's the set of natural numbers. For any ordinal alpha, Aleph alpha plus one is the Hartog's number. Remember, this is the notation I used for Hartog's number. The Hartog's number of Aleph alpha. So this is the Hartog's number of Aleph alpha. So I tell you what to do at the zero stage. I tell you what to do at successor stages. Now I have to tell you what to do at limit stages. At the limit stages, you take the supremum of the previous guys. Beta, beta less than gamma for limit ordinals gamma. Now these are the LF numbers. These are supposed to form a complete list of cardinal numbers, as we shall prove. So, but let's first understand the picture of these. Now, I have my finite ordinals, which are also finite cardinals, and I have Aleph zero, which is omega. Now, I have the Hartog's number of Aleph zero, which is Aleph one. This is the same as omega one. Okay, this is the Hartog's number of this. Now, I have these ordinals continue. I have the Hartog's number of this guy. Remember the definition of Hartog's number. Hartog's number of this is the least ordinal from which there is no injection to this guy. Okay? So this is the Hartog's number of this. And for every ordinal, okay, let me continue. I have Aleph 3, that, 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 that. I have Aleph Omega, that, 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 that. For every ordinal alpha, I have some Aleph number. Now I claim that these are exactly the cardinal numbers, okay? Let's prove one direction of this claim. Oh, let me write this down. Clearly, if alpha is less than beta, like this, this follows from the definition. Aleph alpha is less than aleph beta. Because, let's say, assume that this is, this is a successor. Then this is supposed to be, let's say that this is theta plus one. Then this is supposed to be the Hartog's number of aleph theta. But, <laughs> okay. I don't want to explain the full transfinite induction. Just you can prove this easily by a transfinite induction, okay? How many minutes do I have? Seven. We have this. And so the class of Aleph numbers is form a proper class. The class of Aleph numbers is not a set. The reason is the following. If it were a set, I would do the following. For every Aleph number, I have a corresponding ordinal. And these ordinals are different. So, if the class of or, uh, Aleph numbers were a set, by axiom of replacement, the class of ordinal numbers would be a set. But the class of ordinal numbers is not a set. Therefore, the class of Aleph numbers cannot be a set. Okay, so this is a proper class. There are just too many of these guys to be put in a single set. Now, uh, lemma, which I'm gonna try to squeeze into five minutes. At this point, it's not immediately clear that these Aleph numbers are actually cardinals. We're going to prove this. For all ordinals, alpha, Aleph alpha is a, 
cardinal number. Now, this is a statement which starts with, for all ordinals something happens. How do I prove this? By, by transfinite induction. We proceed by transfinite induction. Now, for the zeroth case, it's clear. LF0 is omega, and this is a cardinal number because it's not equanimous with previous ordinals, which are finite. Okay? If this were not a cardinal number, we would violate the pigeonhole principle. Now, let alpha be an ordinal and assume that the claim holds for alpha. As alpha plus 1 is the Hartog's number of alpha, alpha alpha plus 1 is not equinumerous with a subset of LF alpha. Moreover, this guy is, well, any element of this guy by definition is equinumerous with a subset of alpha alpha because this is the least ordinal from which there's no injection to alpha alpha so this is itself not equinumerous with a subset of alpha alpha all its elements are equinumerous with subsets of alpha alpha therefore this is a cardinal number is a cardinal number. I, you might have realized I didn't use the inductive assumption. I'm going to use it for the limit case. Okay. Now the final case. I have three minutes. I have to be quick. Now let gamma be a limit ordinal and assume that the claim holds for all alpha less than gamma. Okay? Now, we want to show that this guy is a cardinal. If this were not a cardinal, then there would be some ordinal, by definition of being a cardinal, there would be an ordinal delta less than this, such that these are equinumerous. There's a bijection between these guys. In this case, now by definition of alpha omega, this is supposed to be the supreme of all previous LF numbers. I have something strictly less than this. Okay, let me write it like this. This is supposed to be the supreme of all LF betas where beta is less than gamma. This is the supremum of all these guys. 
This is strictly less than Aleph Gamma, which means that one of these Aleph Betas exceed Delta. Okay. By definition of blah, 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 there would be theta less than gamma such that this is strict less than this is less than or equal to aleph theta. This is by definition of aleph gamma. You have something smaller strictly, okay, this is aleph gamma. You have something strictly smaller than this because this is the supreme of certain numbers, certain ordinals, you would be able to find some guy which is strictly, which is less than, which is greater than equal to this. But this guy is strictly less than Aleph theta plus one, okay? This is a, this gives a contradiction as let's see this guy it's a subset of alpha omega because every cardinal it's 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 a, it's the set of previous cardinals right it follows from that now I don't have enough time, so I'm just going to use symbols to explain this. This is a subset of this. This guy is equinumerous with delta, which is a subset of Aleph theta. So there is an injection from Aleph theta plus 1 to Aleph theta. Which gives uh, this contradicts as maybe I should write the sentence over here. It gives an injection from Aleph theta plus one to Aleph theta, okay? But I assume that the claim holds for all alpha less than gamma. In particular, this is supposed to have strictly larger cardinality than this. This is not supposed to inject into this because if this injected into this, then the cardinality of this would be less than or equal to the cardinality of that. Okay? Well, I mean, more specifically, if this injects into this, then the least cardinal with which this, e this is equinumerous is less than or equal to Aleph theta, but this is not supposed to be the case because this is the Hartog's number of this, so there is supposed to be no injection from. Well, this is by definition. There is supposed to be no injection from here to here because this is the Hartog's number of this. Why am I trying to explain it with an argument that's just assuming, that's just trying to do too much? Anyway, so these Aleph numbers are actually cardinals. We're going to start next lecture by showing that cardinal. We're going to show the reverse direction. We're going to show that every cardinal is one of these Aleph alphas, okay? So I showed that all of these guys are cardinals. Next lecture, I'm going to show that every cardinal is one of these. And then this will be a complete list of cardinals. And then we're going to try to understand the arithmetic on cardinal numbers. We're going to, the arithmetic on cardinals will be very different than our arithmetic on ordinals. We're going to make different, we're going to, define it in such a way that they're very, very different. For example, omega to the omega is a countable ordinal as a, in the ordinal arithmetic, but Aleph zero to the Aleph zero in cardinal arithmetic is uncountable. And except exponentiation, cardinal arithmetic will be very easy 
sum and product of two infinite cardinals will be the maximum of them all the time. The exponentiation in cardinals it's going to be really difficult in a sense that I'm going to explain later. It will be really difficult in the sense that we won't be able to prove anything about it except some cool results due to Koenig. Okay, so sorry for the extra four minutes. I will see you next Tuesday.